Um, we'll go ahead and get started with, uh, well, let me just make a couple of announcements. Senator Sonier will not be attending today's committee. Of course, once we get a quorum established, we will uh, adopt the rules and we're gonna allow Senator Fuller to present first and that is going to be, let me make sure I got the right item. Item number two, SB 1081 Fuller. That's public health care Medi-Cal demonstration project. It's an urgency bill. And um, just for information, we just did get a letter of opposition from the California Primary Care Association, unless amended for this particular bill, as well as a letter of opposition to SB 1079 Rubio inmate medical treatment from the AC. Uh, LU. So with that, uh, welcome, Senator, and um, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. AB 1081 is a simple but technical bill that allows district hospitals to apply and participate as a low-income health program provider under the provisions of the Medi-Cal expansion when a county chooses not to participate in the program. Basically, it's a, a one-line change to, to, to allow their participation. Under current law, the county's lack of participation precludes the district hospital from leveraging the federal dollars that are available under the 2010 Medicaid waiver, as the applicant must be a county, city, and, and county health authority or consortium of counties serving a region. By allowing these district hospitals to apply directly for this program, we can improve health care access, especially for many in rural areas when there just aren't other entities to apply for these dollars. In my district, the Tulare Regional Medical Center would like to be able to contract as a provider but has been unable to get the county, Tulare County's participation in applying. So by expanding coverage to more areas in California, we will ensure that the stated goals of the Medi-Cal expansion can be achieved throughout California without a cost to the state general fund, while allowing additional federal dollars to be generated for California. I really appreciate the work of the committee staff in working with my office and the sponsors to address some technical issues with the bill, and the sergeants have provided you with a mock-up of the bill and those amendments. I have today with me Sharita Lane, representing the District Hospital Leadership Forum, and who are the sponsors of this legislation, and Lindsay Mann from the Kauia Hospital. And I'd like to address any questions to them. Thank you very much. Uh, please, uh, again, welcome. State your name and your position. My name is Lindsay Mann. I serve as Chief Executive Officer of Kauia Delta Healthcare District in Visalia, California, a hospital and health system in Tulare County, along with two other district hospitals, public entities, Tulare Regional Medical Center and Sierra View District Hospital. We have been working for the last six months with the County of Tulare to implement the Low Income Health Program, which is often referred to as a bridge to health care reform. It's an 18-month program which will produce about $4.5 million of funding for those that are not currently covered in Tulare County as a precursor to implementing the Affordable Care Act in January 2014. Uh, we are hopeful, and our first and primary position is that the County of Tulare will take its uh, intended role as the contractor for the Low Income Health Program. We have not concluded these discussions, but over the six months, we have not come to such agreements in spite of uh, numerous meetings and explanations of how the program functions. And if those discussions fail, Tulare County, the second most impoverished county next to Fresno only, in, out of 58 counties, cannot afford to miss $4.5 million of funding for the actual patients. And it really does come down to patient care. And I'll wrap up my comments here. Cui Delta, over the last two years in our area, given the economy and also the highly agricultural area that we are within, has seen our uncompensated care go from $13 million a year to $29 million a year, not in charges, that is hard costs, uh, and we are vitally interested in not missing the opportunity that is being uh, pursued by most other counties in California. And again, our first preference is clearly to have the program led by the County of Tulare, only as a fallback position. We appreciate the Senator sponsoring this bill. These three district hospitals, 
because we are public entities, we would want to have the capacity to probably through an administrative services organization like Blue Cross, Blue Shield, uh, serve as the contractor and administer the program for the 18 months of its life. And uh, that's the extent of our, uh, I could go on, but that really is the short of what we're trying to accomplish here. Again, it's a fallback position. We hope the county, and by the way, to add some inspiration to our uh, discussion about our county dialogue, the Board of Supervisors of Tulare County, and, and while I speak of our county, this is an issue in other areas. We have no county hospital. We have uh, no University of California hospital system. These three district hospitals are the safety net hospitals. Uh, I am hopeful that on April 17th, when the Tulare County Board of Supervisors hears the matter, that they not only are educated, but opine favorably on assuming their role as the contractor for the low income health program, lest we, without this bill, lose these $4.5 million and provide, and this is really the final and the most important point of the entire discussion, and provide for Tulare County residents $4.5 million of funding without which we'll simply have uncompensated care and no coverage for uh, the individuals that we're trying to bridge to health care reform. Thank you. Um, proceed. Mr. Chair, Member Sharita Lane with the District Hospital Leadership Forum. I uh, just want to reiterate what um, Mr. Mann and the Senator have both uh, indicated relative to the program, specifically in Tulare County. These are district hospitals, public hospitals. They are very eager to uh, ensure that the, the uh, beneficiaries, the low-income beneficiaries in Tulare County can receive health care coverage. Uh, which is what this program is meant to do. We've been uh, working with the hospitals, all three of them, and in discussions with the counties, stand ready to coordinate with the counties on um, the functions that the county currently uh, performs, such as you know pr uh, eligibility, uh, enrollment, et cetera. So it's, um, it's, we're stand ready to go, as Mr. Mann indicated, we'd like the county to move forward, but if not, the, uh, the county would be well served to ensure there is a lip in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else in support? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Health, Beth Capella on behalf of Health Access California, we had sought some amendments. We are in support. We had sought some amendments. If we could just, I know we normally have a two and two rule, but the agenda is mercifully brief today, unlike other days. Would, would you mind if we interrupt? We do have a quorum. I'd like to establish that if you don't mind. Um, I apologize. Uh, call the roll, please. Senator Hernandez. Here. Hernandez here. Harmon. Here. Harmon here. Alquist. Here. Alquist here. Anderson. Blakesley. Here. Blakesley here. De Leon. Desaunier. Rubio. Wolk. Here. Well, here. Uh, quorum has been uh, established, and if you don't mind, we have some real quick business I'd like to dispense with. I'd like to, uh, the changes to the Senate Health Committee rules for 2011-12 legislative session. We have a motion to adopt the rules and the rule change without objection. Uh, we okay to, well, should we call the roll or we're good? Okay. We're good. Okay, the, the, the rules have been adopted. I uh, apologize for the interruption. Uh, please proceed. Of course, Mr. Chair. Again, Beth Capel on behalf of Health Access California. We support having a lip in every county. We support it enough that we've devoted the time of several of Health Access's staff to working at the county level, not me, but uh, others among our staff, and as have other organizations, including my colleagues at Legal Services and others, to trying to work with counties to get LIPS operational. We're in support of this bill. We appreciate the amendments that the committee staff uh, drafted that helped to address our concern that the district hospitals work with the counties. We also appreciate the testimony of Tulare District Hospital. Our only remaining question, and it's something we're happy to work with the sponsors and the authors on as it moves along, is um, which other counties might this apply to? Most counties have proceeded, and among the three, there are very few who have not proceeded to implement the LIPS. Some of them do not have district hospitals, so just as we go forward, we'd like to work with the author on that. Thank you. Mr. Chair and members, Vanessa Hino, the Western Center on Law and Poverty, very encouraged by the discussions that we've had with the district hospitals and the Senator's office in terms of ensuring that county eligibility processes are maintained so that low-income residents in Tulare County and Tulare County can draw down the funds that they've been pro promised from the federal government. Thank you very much. So it's not opposition 
it's it's we were in a supportive amended we okay. appreciate the amendments we will look forward to working on additional spe additional amendments as the measure proceeds we would also want to make sure that we're working with counties on um, the people who are enrolled in the LIP transitioning to Medi-Cal in 2014, we would hope that this would happen in Tulare County as well. It's, it's a okay. friendly conversation. Okay, so again, same position. We're in support and have been the entire time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. You guys can go ahead and stay here because I'm assuming there'll be some questions as well. Is there anyone in opposition to the measure? Chair and members, Doug Kim with the Primary Care Association. I want to apologize to the committee and to the author for getting our opposition in so late. We, we had a misunderstanding and we thought this bill was going to be heard much later. Uh, we're not opposed to LIPS at all. And uh, most of our concerns actually are raised in your analysis, uh, either by the Health Access or the Western Center people. Uh, they relate to the implementation. We want to make sure the county, county of Tulare, for example, stay, uh, stays involved. Um, we are also, we note, as your uh, analysis points out, the County Board of Supervisors is expected to uh, act on this proposal or this request on April 17th, and we were initially unsure as to why uh, we didn't, the uh, sponsors did not want to wait until after the board acted. Uh, but we look forward to working with the author and staff and with the sponsors uh, to address the same concerns that are reflected already in your analysis. Thank you. Anyone else in opposition? Is there any questions from any of the members? Yes, uh, Senator Woke. <clears throat> yes, I acknowledge the, the late opposition, and I, uh, I am prepared to move the bill um, as amended. Um, and I just want a um, commitment from the author to work um, with the Primary Care Association on that um, issue that they raised in late Absolutely. opposition. Absolutely. We'll be glad to work with them. I think our, our our primary interest is over the long term that um, all those that can carry on both programs be involved, but at this point, we need to move the bill along so that we can uh, make sure that we're not inadvertently left out if the county doesn't decide to participate. So thank you, and we absolutely will work with them. I'd be glad to move the bill. Okay, we have a motion to move the bill by Woke. I'll just make just a few closing remarks, uh, or if you'd like to just close. I'd just like to urge a yes vote and thank you very much. Okay, I just uh, appreciate you bringing the bill forward. Obviously, we, we need to make sure that the low income health plan is uh, implemented. I understand that it's still gonna be within a short time period and it needs to uh, be done by 2013. Uh, it would have been nice if the counties could take on this responsibility, but obviously the health districts are gonna be stepping up to do it. Um, and I think the question was answered that I would have had is how are you going to do it in such a short period? And my understanding is that you're going to be contracting with either some kind of health entity, whether it's Blue Cross or Blue Shield, as a contractor, correct? But maybe just one question before um, you know we call the roll is um, how are you going to um, do the transition from that point on after, through uh, health care reform at that point? With um, like like with all the other counties, we're working closely with the uh, counties that already have lips up and running to to learn from what they're doing and to also be able to um, you know benefit from that. Uh, as you mentioned, we'll be contracting with an ASO, and so all of uh, and then working closely with the counties because they still uh, county even if they're not the contractor still has a piece of this. So all of that coordination will continue into 2014. Perfect. Thank you. Question. Sorry, Senator Harmon? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to make sure that uh, I have a, you know, a mock-up of some amendments. So these are the amendments that will be taken as author's amendments, and, and the author is acceptable with those amendments, and that's the motion as amended? Yes, the motion, motion as amended, and also there was a commitment uh, as so per uh, Senator Woke to continue to work with the yes. opposed, primary yeah, the Primary Care but Association. Those amendments that were mentioned by one of the witnesses are not before us today. We're going to work correct. on those later. Okay, thank correct. you very much. Okay, so we have a due pass as amended to appropriations. Uh, Senator Woke uh, made the motion. Uh, Secretary, call the roll. Senator Hernandez. 
Senator Hernandez. Aye. Hernandez, aye. Harmon. Aye. Harmon, aye. Alquist. Aye. Alquist, aye. Anderson. Aye. Anderson, aye. Blakesley. Aye. Blakesley, aye. De Leon. Desaunier. Rubio. Aye. Rubio, aye. Wolk. Aye. Wolk, aye. That has seven, yeah. zero. We, I think we have some members that are, I think, or not. Oh, De Leon. So we'll keep, we'll hold the bill and then lift it to allow him to add on at a later time, but thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, he's in rules also. Okay, <laughs> well as soon as uh, he gets done, we'll bring him back and then have him vote on the rest of the bills. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, item number three, Senator Pavley, SB 1381, mental retardation, change of term to intellectual disability. Good afternoon, Senator, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Hernandez and, and members. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to propose author's amendments that hopefully have been distributed to the committee. Yes, we have them in okay, front of us, and good. I'm assuming, uh, Senator and Harbin, you have a copy as well? And these amendments state that the changes made by uh, this particular bill will occur during routine revisions to laws and documents over the next several years, so it's no, uh, to cut down expenses. So when you change laws, this would be uh, part of the list to do that. Uh, this is a simple measure that I think we can all agree on, you know, words matter times of change and it's in one of these areas of law that we have to uh, have a statute and a bill come before you to make these changes in law. We need to standardize rules and laws so that there's no conflict between state and federal law and clarify any conflicting terminology. And I would like to share with you that 42 other states have already eliminated uh, this out outdated inappropriate use of what we call the R word, and California needs to also as part of a statutory process, and that's why this bill is for in front of you today. It is an outdated uh, word and term um, as a parent of a developmentally uh, intellectually disabled child um, and someone who's been a classroom teacher for years. Um, the word retarded has been used as a put down in a way to make fun of people in general. Um, as I told you, words matter and words hurt and uh, people that, that have been born or inflicted with intellectual disabilities um, should not have this outdated term that's so negatively uh, received being used against them or as a joke against other people that may be make an unfortunate mistake and are referred to that way. So uh, as we progress as a society, we lots of times change names and terms when we realize they're offensive to groups of people. This is one of those cases. 42 states have already made this statutory change. California should as well. And it'll also um, clarify once and for all between federal and state languages so that we're all on the same page. Uh, referring to instead of mental retardation or mentally retarded, um, a term that's a lot more sensitive and actually accurate in defining people as being intellectually uh, disabled. This bill is sponsored by the ARC, and I have some speakers here today to testify in support of the bill. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, please state your name and your position. Uh, Tony Anderson, I'm the executive director of the ARC of California and uh, also representing a, a collaborative, a public policy collaborative of United Street Bull Palsy and the ARC. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and to speak on this important issue. Um, we're, um, uh, we're, we're very proud to be representing this issue. Uh, our members have come to us for many years now on this topic and have asked that we do something uh, to try to impact uh, the terminology and statute. Uh, a few years back, we had an, a national um, uh, uh, alliance for full participation. We brought thousands of people from all over the country. And uh, one thing we did was we pulled everybody that was there from our community and asked them what was important to them. And when you drill down to the people with disabilities, the number one thing, with all of everything else that's out there, the number one thing was the issue of the R word, being called retarded and its association with being bullied and victimized in many different formats. So um, 
for, uh, for several decades ago, we used to have a term called imbecile and moron and, uh, and idiot, and those were the clinical terms that were, that were used. And obviously, we all know that those are offensive words today. And then it was changed at some point to uh, retardation, mental retardation. And it was differentiated for uh, levels on the IQ. So it was moderate and severe and profound. And today, I think everybody knows that those are all offensive words, and they are used in different formats and different forms to um, belittle people with intellectual disabilities and to uh, devalue them as citizens. Now, obviously, there are um, many people who love and honor people with developmental disabilities, their families, their friends, and all of their supporters. But still today, they are victimized and abused on the playgrounds and on the buses and in all parts of community uh, at rates that are much higher and sometimes reported 10 times higher than the general population. So it is a group that has been uh, victimized and pointed out. And um, one way that you can continue to do that to a group of people, in our view, is to find ways to devalue them and do it through language. And language really makes a big difference. And um, so we really urge the, the support of this bill. It's, it may not seem that important, and I know people have said that um, you're trying to uh, dictate the words that people can use, but in fact, it's just looking at the statute. The statute of the rules for the services that are supporting people with intellectual disabilities. And for us to use the words that are extremely offensive to the community that it's trying to support uh, is wrong. And so we please, we ask that you please support this small piece of legislation and um, it, will, it will make a huge difference to families all over our state. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next um, presenter, please state your name and your position. Well, I, I'm Charles Murray and I, I am 21 years old and I also live in Sacramento, California. For the number two is I have come to the cap to the Capitol today to testify in favor of SB 1381. Um, when I hear the word, the R word, it makes me sad and, and uncomfortable. Okay, let's see. I will prefer to my teachers and doctors to use the term intellectual disabilities. The R word hurts me and my friends. When, I, when my friend was called the R word, it makes you sad and cry. Um, I have many talents and skills that are um, separate from my disabilities, such as this speech, which I've written by myself. I am I am a person first, and a person with a intellectual disability second. There is there is no room for for me in the our world. So thanks for your time, Cecily Charles Murray. Thank you, and you did a great job. You're probably the best presenter we've had all day. Mm -hmm. Did a great job. Thank you very much. Uh, next presenter, please state so, your name and position. Thank you. Th thank you, sir. Uh, hard act to follow. Great job. Uh, I'm uh, Rick Rollins. I'm here today on behalf of ARCA, the Association of Regional Center Agencies, and also the Alliance of California Autism Organizations, and probably most importantly as a parent of a son with a developmental disability. This bill will be the most significant bill I think that you're going to vote on this year as a non-fiscal bill. Uh, it's uh, got a lot, lot, just tremendous support throughout the entire developmental disabilities community. It's time that we uh, kind of get with it and uh, establish, uh, as is established, uh, intellectual disability as a terminology for folks with intellectual disabilities and be done with uh, one of the uh, many six-letter words that need to be removed from our, uh, our vocabulary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, state name and uh, position, please. Thank you, Senators. Casey Koneko of Platinum Advisors on behalf of Best Buddies. And we urge you to vote aye on this measure. Thank you. It's very important, as you've heard. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Melissa Cortez Roth on behalf of Autism Speaks in support of the bill. 
Hi, my name is Elisa Harless, and I am here representing the National Association of Social Workers, and we are in support of this bill, and I am also personally in support of this bill as a sister of a person with an intellectual disability. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Dwight Hanson on behalf of the California Disability Services Association for all the reasons you've already heard in support. Thank you very much. Tim Hornbecker, former CEO of the ARC of San Francisco, currently working part-time after I retired with the ARC California as a director of community advocacy. And I just want to uh, address very briefly that Goethe has a saying, the philosopher, how you say things becomes how you think. And I can tell you from my experience uh, over 40 years now working in this field that this is a word that has not gone away. It's still used in the playgrounds as retard, as, as people being called. I had about five, well, I think it was about 80 people in front of the theater downtown San Francisco objecting to Tropic Thunder and the use of the word they did not want to be called retards and it's used in that film and I had a, a speaker a, a television station come out and interview one of our clients Ray and she says well, why does this bother you so much and she said well how she says, with a name like mine Ray what do you think they called me all through high school retard Ray he said that just really hurts and it doesn't go away and I had a father come up and pass me up and he has a little girl and he just came up and personally said thank you so much he said, my daughter's only three with Down syndrome, but I can see that I have a long road to go of what maybe my daughter's gonna face when she gets to grammar school and high school. So please, I'm very much in support of making these changes like we've done nationally with Rosa's Law. Thank you very much. Anyone else in support? Is there anyone in, you have another support? My name is Brittany Wilthord, and I live, I'm 22 years old, and I live in Sacramento, California. And I support the bill so people not call people retarded. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, this is my daughter, Sydney. My name is Carol Dethridge, and I also support the bill. Thank you. Anyone else in support? Is there any opposition to the measure? Is there any questions from any of the members, uh, Senator Anderson? Uh, how would this impact uh, the medical or technical term or, uh, or clinical terms in moving forward? Um, I'm not sure if you were here, but as you make routine revisions to laws and documents over the next several years, you would gradually replace the terms, and this is to make sure that the state laws are now consistent with federal laws using the same terminologies. Okay, and uh, I'd like to be added as a co-author. Thank you very uh, much. I, uh, went, before I got elected, I had a lot more free time, and, and I spent a lot of time with Special Olympics, and I think that this is, uh, you, you I really understand. appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. You understand that words do matter. And may I also add, um, when we're making amendments to this, Chair Anderson, uh, Senator Rubio is a joint author on this. Uh, I believe Senator well, Harmon was uh, I'd have question. to be a joint author too then oh. if, <laughs> if that's available. We'll just add a lot to the names. I was hoping eventually this would just be on the consent calendar. It seems like just because of, you had to, I wouldn't have carried the bill if we could just sort of change this gradually, but because there's federal words now in place and statute and 40 other, 42 other states have done this to make sure that the terminology is all the same in order to, um, delete conflicting terminologies for federal health education or labor related issues, it became uh, important to have a bill to accomplish that objective. Hey, Senator Harmon. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I, I agree uh, that this is a very important bill, Senator Pavley, and I'm pleased to be uh, in support of it. Uh, I did want to just briefly uh, get assurances from you that it is uh, not perhaps your intention to make this into a spot bill at some time in the future. I think it's too important to do that, but sometimes when we see bills with just word changes and technical changes in the middle of the night, there's a gut and amend, and we see an entirely new bill, so I'm sure that's not your intention. Uh, not on this bill at all. I would, I would yes. agree. I, now, the, can, other, the other point that I want Again, I was trying to figure out how to do this without making it a bill, because it seems like such 
an easy, important thing to do that shouldn't right. require legislation, but because you have to change statute and terminology, it had to be in a bill form. It is not a spot yes. bill. Uh, our Republican analysis indicates that there's a somewhat companion yes. bill pending on the assembly side of the, of the uh, building, AB 2370 by Assemblyman Mansoor, pretty much the same as yours as I look at it. But the one thing that caught my attention in our analysis if I could read this to you, it says that that bill says that nothing in that measure is to be construed as making changes to services being provided or eligibility standards in effect at the time of enactment. And I'm just wondering, is that needed in your bill? Could there be let, some let inadvertent that. consequences that yeah. maybe let, it should Let be? me think about that, but to ask your prior question, which probably if you don't mind, I'll interject. Oh, I may be able to answer that for you. It's already in uh, page number two, section five B, nothing in this act shall be construed as making a substantive oh, change in law or good. a change to the services being provided to eligibility and standards we have someone to clarify at the that. time Thank of you. an enactment. So it, it, there is a similar. Uh, uh, good. Okay. I, well, I was bill. worried that, you know, you might wind up with some inadvertent consequences. Uh, I'm glad that's in there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all my question. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Senator Blasey. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> the goal here is laudable. Um, I think it's uh, worthy of um, addressing the stigma which has become attached to a particular word. So my questions or concerns are not directed toward trying to remedy the problem. My question goes to whether or not the term that's been selected is the proper one or whether there may not be a, a better term or better terms and whether or not this term could have some unintended consequences. So I'd like to explore that a little bit. Uh, so for example, um, and this may be a simple example, if you have a term of art like cancer and let's say there is a stigma attached to cancer and you said we're going to change that term to physical disability we would all understand, well, the term physical disability is so broad, it can cover many conditions, cancer being simply one of them. And I'm a little worried that we may be in a similar circumstance. I was uh, online a few minutes ago and looked at people, famous people in history who are identified as possible individuals who experience Asperger's disease, which I think most of us would consider perhaps uh, intellectual disability. And it included people like Albert Einstein. It included uh, people like uh, Newton um, and many famous authors and poets. And so whereas the term of art that's described here that we're replacing speaks to a very specific subset of intellectual disability, there are many, we're, as we get to understand the, the functioning of the human brain, um, we're understanding there's many forms and many of them are congenital, they come uh, through uh, your genes and their uh, manifest and evidence very early. So I'm, I'm concerned that this term is potentially so broad and would cover so many conditions that are certainly not synonymous with mental retardation that um, w in our effort to try and take one word out, we may have actually um, failed to recognize a specific set of people that were trying to help with this problem and the broad term of intellectual disability um, um, is, is probably not a good uh, substitution. And then I have a, a follow-up question, um, if you could speak to that concern I have. Uh, it could, I, I believe um, my witness would like to address that uh, as well. Of course, one thing we were trying to do, Senator Blakesley and I get what you're saying, um, is that we were trying to match what is the federal definition so that we can comply with programs and policies that meet that definition as they have stated. So this was in order for consistency and terminology, but mm -hmm. let's hear from the other experts. I appreciate the, the question because it, it, it has actually been a part of our discussion for several years now. And in fact, the American Association of Mental Retardation changed their name about two, three years ago now to the American Association of Intellectual Disabilities. And, uh, and as well, the, uh, the DSM, as you know, is being uh, reworked. And the uh, term for consideration right now to replace mental retardation is intellectual disability. And then the last part was that Rose's Law uh, uh, uses the term 
intellectual disability, and that's the new federal term to try to um, coordinate throughout the states. And uh, from my perspective, in representing the regional centers, uh, we've looked at this bill closely on eligibility issues for sure and uh, potential costs to the state. And this uh, change, which is uh, one that has happened in 42 other states uh, and also uh, places like the UC Davis Mind Institute, where I am the, one of the founding fathers, uh, has been used for many years now. And we don't see any impl implications of changing the term mental retardation to intellectual disabilities. It's a well-established term in the, uh, in the literature as well. And that's in term of, of this um, issue of eligibility standard, which was brought up a few minutes ago, right. because to qualify for a certain right. state program, we understand it's targeted to individuals who, under the prior definition of mental retardation, was someone who had an IQ below 70 or 75, was a specific enumerated level, if I've read correctly. Uh, and yes. so you don't see that problem. My follow-up question um, is in the use of the word uh, disability, California state law is much more expansive than federal law in terms of affording and defining specific protected class status mm -hmm. to people uh, with disabilities on a very broad spectrum. And we've been at the forefront. We go much further than federal law does when it comes to defining those protections, not for eligibility, but for the purpose of, frankly, lawsuits. And if we are now ascribing the term intellectual disability and not to individuals with an IQ below 70 to 75, uh, only, but potentially it could capture all these other instances um, that uh, could be described as intellectual disability. Are we creating, are we broadening protected classes in ways that would have implications that go far beyond this piece of legislation? And maybe that needs to go to judiciary to answer that question. Um, well, yes, I, I'm. I know what you're concerned about from the. And I don't think that's your intention. Set. That right. is not it. But, but the term of art is a very powerful one in California when you use the term disability. Yes. Correct. Correct. So the term um, mental retardation was um, it was part of developmental disabilities. So if you you take out that term and you replace it with intellectual disabilities, it still falls underneath that category of developmental disabilities. And uh, you, Senator, you are correct that uh, California has a tighter definition of developmental disability than what the federal government does, and particularly uh, in the regional center system where we have a uh, situation where we have uh, particular types of developmental disabilities that are, el that are eligible for uh, services. Uh, this bill doesn't do anything to change, for instance, my son's diagnosis of autism. He still has a diagnosis of autism. He doesn't have a diagnosis of intellectual disability. Okay. Well, thank you. Great answers. Um, uh, I'll be supporting the bill, but I wanted to use this opportunity to raise the concerns mm -hmm. that the author perhaps could explore these issues because I, none of us want unintended consequences. Right. We want to be sure that the services we provide or the legal standing that's afforded, if it is targeted to people with particular needs, we don't inadvertently make them so broad um, um, that we haven't gone through a legislative process to discuss those other issues. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Senator Blakesley. I believe, Senator Ruby, did you have a question or not? I, or, or a comment? A comment, and then I'd like to move the bill, Mr. Chair. Sure. Uh, certainly. I mean, uh, Senator Blakesley, the, the law of unintended consequences is one thing. The idea of taking those who have an intellectual disability and putting them in another protective class is something I'm willing to err on that side of, not only today, but also into the future. Uh, so even if it is, it's one that we could wrestle with sometime into the future. 1914 was the last, was the first time mental retardation was used. It's been 102 years since we've looked at updating it in the state of California, so it's long overdue. I want to applaud the author uh, and all those who came forward, even though should we not need a bill for this particular item or fix, it gives us the opportunity to hear from Brittany, Cindy, and I believe his name was Charles, and so that's always a good thing. And so thank you for uh, adding us on as, as co-authors, and I'll move on the bill, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We have a uh, motion by Senator Rubio. It's due pass as amended. Um, did you, would you like to make some closing remarks, Senator? I appreciate the conversation and the comments and the questions. I respectfully ask for your I vote, and I'd also like to acknowledge and um, extend my appreciation to the sponsor of Bill, the ARC. Thank you very much. Uh, as 
We have a due pass as amended. The chair is recommending I vote. Secretary, call a roll. Senator Hernandez. Aye. Hernandez, aye. Harmon. Aye. Harmon, aye. Alquist. Anderson. Aye. Anderson, aye. Blakesley. Aye. Blakesley, aye. De Leon. Desaunier. Rubio. Aye. Rubio, aye. Wolk. Aye. Wolk, aye. That has six uh, zero at this time. We have an absent member, I believe, uh, Alquist, or two, Alquist and Senator DeLeon. We will keep the bill on call until they return and add them, but it looks like it should get out without any problems. Senator. Thank you very much. Thank you, and have a good Thank afternoon. You. We have uh, item number one, uh, SB 1079, Rubio Inmates Medical Treatment. It's our last one for the day. To go from a worthy subject to not so worthy of a subject, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and colleagues. Uh, it's an honor to be able to bring forward SB 1079, which would eliminate unnecessary medical procedures uh, put into statute to, stave, to save the limited state resources by requiring uh, CDCR, California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, to only provide medically necessary services that are supported by outcome data and physician judgment. Where is this bill coming from? Mr. Chair, I'll tell you that a couple years ago, uh, there was an inmate in the Department of Corrections that brought forward a lawsuit uh, and argued that the state should be on the hook, pay for uh, a sex change. And while uh, this bill does not touch or deal with the hormonal therapy that is, has been and will continue to be uh, provided within the Department of Corrections, the law is silent. And so the um, receiver is now ending his time and the state of California will be leaving. This bill is very simple. It codifies what is in regulation today and makes it very clear that within the state of California, medically necessary procedures uh, will only be provided to provide good quality care uh, to save the taxpayers in the state of California. I respectfully ask for a I vote, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Is there anyone who'd like to speak in support of the measure? Is there any opposition to the bill? When's time for comment? Good afternoon. Yeah, welcome. Please state your name and your position. My name is Christina Wirtz and I'm with the Transgender Law Center in San Francisco. Um, and we are opposed to this piece of legislation. This bill puts legislators in the place of qualified medical professionals and CDCR regulators to make determinations that specific procedures are medically unnecessary in all instances. The bill specifically targets transgender people in prison by preventing medical professionals within the CDR, CDCR from undertaking independent evaluations on the healthcare needs of transgender individuals to determine what's medically necessary. And in fact, all of the leading medical associations have made determinations recognizing that transition-related health care is medically necessary for transgender individuals with gender identity disorder. The American Medical Association, the American Psychological Association, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists have all recognized that treatment related to gender transition is medically necessary care. In fact, the National Commission on Correctional Health Care issued a position statement in 2010 saying that the health risks of overlooking the particular needs of transgender inmates are so severe that acknowledgement of the problem and policies to assure the appropriate treatment and responsible provision of health care are needed. That same statement advises that determination of the treatment of medically necessary, uh, uh, the excuse me, determination of treatment necessary for transgender patients should be on a case-by-case -case basis and there should be no blanket administrative or other policies that restrict specific medical care to transgender individuals. In fact, there was a lawsuit in Wisconsin where the Seventh Circuit held that a very similar law, the Wisconsin Inmate Sex Change Prevention Act, was held unconstitutional in violation of the Eighth Amendment. And in fact, just on Monday, the U.S. Supreme Court denied cert to that case, which is incredibly similar to this piece of legislation. So I respectfully request your no vote. Did you state the Eighth Amendment or the Ninth Amendment? I'm the Eighth Amendment. The Eighth Amendment, and that was in, the, in the Seventh Circuit in Wisconsin. Yeah. Thank you. And, and through the chair, what did you say the United States Supreme Court did this week? It, it denied to hear the denied, case. Denied. Denied. Thank you. It's busy. Good afternoon. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, please state your name and your position. Valerie Small Navarro with the American Civil Liberties Union, and we are also in opposition for the reasons already stated. 
Uh, furthermore, I'd like to call your attention to some, some broad concerns that it would affect all, all people in prison, not just transgender patients, uh, excuse me, inmates. Um, the, the concern for coming up with the definition of medical, medically necessary is a worthwhile cause and, and we support the author's intent. Unfortunately, some of the elements that he's been focusing on, we believe are inappropriate and really cause us some great concern. And I think it's not just concern um, for the inmates themselves, but for other inmates as well. So for example, on page two of the bill, um, lines 31 through 32, is you'll see a uh, I'm sorry, a definition of severe pain. And this is one of the triggers for treatment. And I'm just gonna read it, it's short, it's just two lines. It says, severe pain means a degree of discomfort that significantly disables the patient from reasonable, independent function. Now, query whether that should really be the definition of when we treat severe pain in our correctional facilities. Um, we, I, I think we have doctors and other medical professionals who are handling people in prison for a good reason. I don't think it's appropriate that the legislature step in with, with this kind of a definition for a trigger for pain. So that's one concern we wanted to raise. Another concern we wanted to raise is on page three of the bill, lines seven through, through 11, and there you will see a list of conditions that quote unquote improve on their own and, and therefore do not necessitate treatment. So we're looking at things like mononucleosis, uh, viral hepatitis A, viral pharyngitis, and forgive me, I, I, I'm not sure of the pronunciation of this term, but I think if you think about it, you really don't, you really don't want a prison full of people with mono or some of these other things. I think that causes um, problems within the prison facility and possibly even outside the facility. So I, I, I query why the legislature is stepping in to substitute its judgment for medical necessity. I think there are people that we've hired that are competent to make these decisions, and I suggest that it's not appropriate for the legislature to be se stepping in. For these reasons, we respectfully oppose. Thank you very much. Anyone else in opposition? Laura Parr on behalf of Equality California in opposition. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, I think we have a question from Senator Wolk. And a Sen Senator Rubio, um, I wanted to, um, I, I'm trying to understand the need for the bill mm -hmm. because as I look at what the existing process is for making these decisions, it seems to me that that they're good and desirable and if an inmate believes they are wrong, um, as this woman, as this um, uh, person did, um, they go to court and it was resolved against, you know, not in, not in the favor of the inmate. You have definitions. You have, um, you know, a medical professionals that decide this with the patient. Um, even excluded treatments can be adopted if. Um, there is a uh, medical authorization review committee um, that would review it. It seems to me that, that that's a good process um, and has served us well. Um, so tell me I, again what the need, why, why you're driven to do this legislation. Two reasons. Uh, first, as you know, the receiver is leaving. So the level of treatment has fluctuated over the years. So we have worked um, diligently as a state under the receivership of the federal government to establish these guidelines. It was recommended that perhaps we should codify those guidelines. That's number one. Number two, I'm looking at making the, the law very clear, in fact, making the law exist, period, because it's non-existent today with respect to elected procedures. It, it has, I've been identified, uh, with respect to gender reassignment surgeries. Uh, that is defined. Um, I would also make the argument on that second point, uh, Senator Wolk, that the state should not be on the hook to defend cases 
where the law is silent to spend hard-earned tax dollar do um, dollars to then defend it in court. And so if we can make it very clear that this is the state law, then perhaps we wouldn't have those challenges into the future. Let me ask, um, if the chair uh, permits, I want to ask um, the witnesses, if we just codified existing regulations without the addition of the um, other procedure, would you have any objection? Yes, we would. We still would have the objection, the objections that I raised in terms of the legislature substituting its judgment. Um, quite honestly, I, I, when I saw this bill, I sent it, uh, or at least our, uh, someone in our office sent it to the prison law office that litigated the case that, that brought on the receiver, and they were very concerned about the underlying standards in this, in this bill as well. They have not... They have not submitted a letter of opposition yet, but they they were definitely concerned. So I just so, I just want to raise that the, the the we haven't seen the the need to codify the regulations. The regulations are the regulations until somebody challenges those. It's not necessary per se to to enact a statute, and we are concerned about the underlying regs. You would agree with that. The transgender law center would also continue to be opposed to this bill if it was just codifying the regulations. Let me let me just follow up on the question by Senator Wolk asked. And as you know, most of everything in here is going to be codified in statute from regulation, and whether it's the entire thing, or and or in, including the uh, item five, six, and seven, uh, which you oppose. During the reg process, did you at all at any time? oppose that because I'm assuming it's an open process, it's public hearing, public testimony, and because it's gone through the regulatory process, it still is in effect, you know, uh, they act on it as if it's law. So during that process, did you at all oppose to it? No, we were, we were not a part of that regulatory process. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wasn't sure, did Senator way. Anderson, did you have a question? I wasn't sure if you did or not. I, I did. Okay, please. Uh, so you're codifying current practice, is that correct? Uh, correct, however, we're adding uh, three procedures to it. Uh, if you looked at uh, page three, it's five, six, and seven, the treatment of sexual dysfunctional fertility and infertility, gender reassignment surgery, and weight reduction surgeries. I'd like to be added as a co-author. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I could just address one thing. Yes, by all means. Thank you very much. It was uh, referred to that this law is very similar to a law that was passed in Wisconsin and has been struck down by the courts. There's a very big difference between this particular bill and what was passed in Wisconsin. We do not touch on the subject of um, hormone therapy. And I think that was a very um, medically necessary, um, it could be argued, uh, element to that bill for which I would argue the court struck it down and we do not touch on that subject we just simply talk about uh, as I stated the three items and specific to the um, gender community gender reassignment surgery not the hormonal therapy thank you very much is there any other questions from any of the members um, okay do we have a motion Senator Anderson would you like to move the bill we have a motion Senator Anderson let me just uh, close as well by making a comment that I would agree and I wanted to just reiterate with some of the comments so I asked about the eighth amendment in the seventh court in Wisconsin that it was specifically for hormone therapy not for um, what was referenced here in the bill as well uh, uh, the chair will be recommending an I vote um, secretary call the roll Senator Hernandez aye. Hernandez aye Harmon aye Harmon aye Alquist Anderson? Aye. Anderson, aye. Blakesley? Aye. Blakesley, aye. DeLeon? DeSaunier? Rubio? Aye. Rubio, aye. Wolk? Aye. That vote has five. Um, we still will hold it open to get see if any other members are going to be adding on. Um, so you're in, all the, you're in all the bills already? Yeah. Oh, okay, all right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we will just, I'll wait here and we'll hold it open until the remainder of the members show up.
Okay, we are going to lift the calls. Um, Senator Desaigne is absent, and my understanding is. Okay, so let's uh, start off with item number one, SB 1079 Rubio. It currently has 5 0. Call the absent members. Alquist, De Leon. Wolk. Okay. That is 5 0. The measure uh, is out. We have file item number two, SB 1081 Fuller. Call the absent members. Senator De Leon. Aye. De Leon, aye. De okay. That is 8 0. Uh, that measure is out. Item number three, SB 1381, Pavley. Current vote is 6 0. Call the absent members. Senator Alquist, De Leon. Aye. De Leon, aye. De Saulnier. That's 7 0. The measure is out. That concludes the business of uh, the Senate Health Committee, and we will adjourn.